In chapter 19, we dive into the world of transition metals and coordination chemistry, talking about that whole middle part of the periodic table that we've largely been ignoring thus far in Chem 2. Okay. So we'll start in this first video with 19.1, talking about transition metals and their compounds. Okay, And I've pulled out the key ideas from there. We're not going to discuss as much about preparation and occurrence as we are properties. And then in the later videos, we'll talk about 19.2 and 19.3. Those are the, arguably the more important parts of the chapters. Okay. So what information do we know about transition metals so far? Okay. We know that in the middle of the periodic table there in the D block and down at the bottom where we have the inner transition metals and the F block, right, we've got a bunch of different funky electron configurations and they can adopt a number of different properties. Okay. Transition metals also can adopt multiple stable oxidation states, multiple different charges and ionic compounds. We're not thinking as much ionic as we are coordination compounds this chapter, but we've seen they've got a variety of charges. Um, and then at the end of this chapter, we're gonna see that the orbitals in transition metals are closer together in energy, which makes it easier for electrons to jump up in energy or fall down in energy. And those electronic transitions can occur in the visible range, which is why the images at the beginning of this chapter show transition metal compounds, which tend to have color to them, as opposed to like an organic compound, it's typically just a white solid. Yep. And you should know by now where they are on the periodic table, right? Groups 3 to 11. And then the inner transition metals below. And jumping back one thing from that previous slide, right? Those oxidation states, if you don't recall how to determine oxidation states or what that means from way back in chapter 4 last semester, make sure you're familiar with that because the oxidation state of a transition metal does correspond to its properties. Okay, because they can vary quite a bit with our transition metals. Okay. They're still metals, so they tend to be hard. They tend to have high melting points. They tend to conduct heat and electricity in the metallic form. Okay. They can form cations, not anions, just cations, positively charged by losing electrons. We can form alloys with them as well to impart special properties. But what's really unique in this chapter in 19.2 and 19.3 is that transition metals can form stable coordination compounds, an idea that was introduced this semester in chapter 15. A coordination compound forms a coordinate covalent bond where something is contributing both the electrons and the bond. And our transition metal is in the middle of a coordination compound. And these guys are usually acting as Lewis acids meaning they are accepting pairs of electrons from a ligand, which is acting as a Lewis base. Together they form a coordination compound or a Lewis acid base adduct. This table here, we see a number of electron configurations that are possible and a number of oxidation states that are therefore possible for our transition metals, right? Looking at the 3D right here. We can use the electron configuration to predict the stable oxidation state, but as you see, there's quite a range there, right? Look at manganese on this slide going all the way up to plus seven, right? The highest one that's known is iridium up to a plus nine oxidation number. Okay? And as I mentioned before, those oxidation states can control the properties. So have that on your radar, the number of different possibilities for these transition metals. Okay, so now we're going to skip a section in the textbook about iron, silver, and copper and how they're isolated and go right to transition metal compounds. Right. Now we're looking at a compound involving a transition metal. And the way that they bond can be ionic or it can be covalent. And here we see the importance of oxidation state. Right. Transition metals with low oxidation numbers tend to form ionic compounds. The higher we get an oxidation number, the higher the chance that we're forming covalent compounds or some type of polyatomic ion involving a coordinate covalent bond. So in this chapter, which is all about transition metal complexes, when we're making these compounds, 
we need to think about first the oxidation state of the metal. Is it going to be low in favor ionic or high in favor covalent? And then a second factor, as we'll see later on, is the electronegativity of the other atoms that are involved on the outside, the terminal atoms that are acting as ligands, the Lewis bases in this situation. Okay. The more polar those ligands are, the more they're going to favor ionic interactions. The more nonpolar they are, they'll favor covalent electrons and sharing. Okay. So what kind of ligands do we tend to see? Okay. Putting these things with a transition metal. We can put them with a halide, okay, so fluoride, chloride, and bromide. And you see that titanium dichloride, titanium trichloride are ionic solids okay, because titanium has a lower oxidation number, two and three respectively. But the higher the oxidation number, right, now TiCl4 is a liquid. The bonding has changed. We also see oxides, which have similar properties to the halides. Yeah, but they can be acidic. We actually talked about that in chapter 14, if you consult your notes there. We have trans transition metal hydroxides and transition metal carbonates as well. And all of these tend to be insoluble in an aqueous system, as some exceptions. We finish this first video with a discussion of superconductors, which is an important idea for your ACS exam. If you haven't heard of them before, know the definition of a superconductor. Some type of material that conducts electricity, right? We just finished discussing electricity in chapter 17. So something that conducts electricity with no resistance, right? So there's no energy that's lost as electricity is being transmitted. And there are a lot of superconductors that exist below a temperature of 23 Kelvin, right? So that's really cold, negative 250 degrees Celsius. And we can achieve that temperature by using liquid helium. Okay. Liquid helium has a temperature of four Kelvin. It's difficult to handle, it's expensive, right? but we can achieve it. And there's a lot of research that's going on to make superconductors that can work at higher temperature. Okay. Now, 90 Kelvin is where we're currently at, right? but using liquid nitrogen has a temperature of 77 Kelvin, it's a thousand times cheaper than liquid helium, right? So if we can find a superconductor that works below 77 Kelvin, then you're in business. And a room temperature superconductor, if you ever wanna figure out work that you can do to win a Nobel Prize, that's a good idea right there, right? Room temperature superconductors, that'd be a huge jump forward in the world of energy. And, but know the definition of superconductor, something that conducts electricity with no resistance. And there's usually a relationship that we can see between temperature and resistance. Okay? Notice as temperature goes down, right? resistance also goes down, which is a, a relationship we tend to see, right? If you have computers in a room, that room tends to be cold, right? Resistance goes down as temperature goes down. And then when you reach that threshold temperature, it drops to zero. So this is where we would identify a superconductor. So the overall trends you should know regarding that idea, as the temperature of a material decreases, it becomes a better conductor. And then when we get below the threshold temperature, then it becomes a superconductor. So it becomes a better, better conductor, meaning the resistance goes down. And these superconductors are used in a lot of fields. Right. Magnetic fields, which have certain ap applications, medical fields, right, things like an MRI, nuclear containment facilities, microchips and computing devices, maglev trains, right, things that are shown right here. Plenty of applications of superconductors. So make sure you know that relationship and definition. Now, in the next video, we'll talk more of specific transition metal complexes and how to name them.